Mac Hammond Ministries presents a video product featuring the teaching ministry of Lynn Hammond. 1 Samuel chapter 10. It has always been and always will be the presence of the Lord that changes you. It has always been the presence of the Lord that changes you so that you can be propelled along into the plan of God, that you can move along and flow along in that plan. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, I don't think I'll just read this, maybe parts of it. The presence, the presence of God here, Samuel has come to anoint a man to be king. But he can't be king just in himself. He's too timid and he's too shy. There's all this outer stuff that's hanging on him that's keeping him from moving into that place. If you would say to him, Saul, you're going to be king. He would have drawn back. He would have said, oh, I, I can't be king. I, I don't have the wherewithal. I, I, I don't have the strength to do this. And I could identify because people have said things to me before. And the Lord has even said things to me before. Lynn, I want you to do so and so. Me? And the reason is because God's presence had to change me so that I could do that. For the church to be glorious in this hour for her to stand and march into the face of God. We must all be changed. Not changed once, but changed on a continual basis. The Bible says from glory to glory to glory. That means that this is a process, a constant flowing process. And so we see what happens here with this man. He began to give him instruction of how he was going to change. And he told him that he was going to go in verse 5 he said now you're going you're to come down the hill of God and you're going to come to the city and you're going to meet a company of prophets. And when you come over that there into that company of prophets the spirit of God or the presence of God is going to be in manifestation. And you're going to step over into that manifestation of the presence of God this man was an unspiritual man. He was not a prophet. He was unspiritual even. But he stepped over there in that company of prophets. And then it said in verse 6 that the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you mightily. And you will show yourself a prophet with them. And you will be turned into another man. When these signs meet you, do you do whatever you find to be done, for God is with you. And so we see that's exactly what happened. He goes down there, and he enters in there with those band, that band of prophets. And when Saul returned back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these things came to pass that day. And when they came to the hill, a band of prophets met him. And in verse 10 it says, And the Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and he spoke under divine inspiration among it. And when all who knew Saul before saw that he spoke, they said one to another, What has come over him? Who, who is nobody but the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And so we see, that it is the presence of the Lord that changes you. It is his presence on a daily basis that changes you. Now every single day, God wants to bring you to a level in his presence, in your life, that you will be equal to anything that comes and ready for anything that comes. That's what happened here with him. That presence made him ready for anything. 
And it made him, he was infused with such presence of God that it made him ready for anything and it made him equal to anything that came when he had to stand in that anointing. And so it is with us. When the presence of the Lord comes, it, when it rushes into us, it makes us sufficient. Not in ourselves, but in Christ's sufficiency. God never even intended for you to be at a loss for words. God never ever intended for something to come up to take you by surprise, some snare. God, he never ever intended for you to run around from crisis to crisis, putting out this fire over here, and then we put out this fire, and then we go over here, and we're going to put out this fire. No, that was never his plan. His plan was because of his presence, you would be in a perpetual state of preparedness. That presence of God prepares you. Now, we're going to talk about levels just a little, but before that, I'm going to take a side journey. Now, one of the greatest hindrances to, I, I, think, I think the word revival is good, because revival speaks of change. Revival does not speak of refreshing. We don't come here and say, God is going to revive us tonight and get refreshed and that be revival. Revival only speaks of change. This man was revived. Saul was revived. And he was revived to do something naturally to do something natural in the world. All right, the great, one of the greatest hindrances to walking with God. You know, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God in habitual fellowship. He walked in an habitual fellowship with God. What does that mean? That means he walked with God all of the time. He didn't have times where he didn't and other times where he did. He walked with God. Now, the hindrance, it comes in this, that we have this common habit of dividing our lives into two areas. And the two areas are the natural and the spiritual. Or we could say the secular and the sacred. We try, we divide up our life. Okay, Lord. And because of all of the necessities of life, we seem to be always crossing back and forth from one to the other, from the natural to the spiritual. Now, if we defined that spiritual life or that spiritual area, we would say that that spiritual area would be that we attain to a heavenly status and God is here. In a sharp contrast is the other world, the world of the natural the world of the flesh, the world of weakness, the world of humanity. And so we divide our life and we divide them up in two compartments. And each one of those, those areas has its own set of action, we might say. The spiritual life or the spiritual area are performed and when we perform it there is this warm feeling of satisfaction because our blessed assurance God himself is pleased with this spiritual side and those spiritual actions consist of prayer and Bible reading and worshiping the Lord and coming to church but they have no direct relation to the natural. However, 
against this spiritual action are all these natural actions. They are the ordinary acti activities, we might say, of life, which we share because we inherited them from Adam. And they would be eating and sleeping and working and looking after all of the needs of our body. And these are all in our mind and in our thinking dull duties. And of course then we are so reluctant all the time apologizing to God for we consider this place to be a place of waste. It is a place where it just zaps me of all my time and it's zapping me of my strength. And so the upshot of this life is that you are always straining and you're pushing and you're uneasy, telling ourselves all the time, well, I'll tell you, one day we're going to lay this world aside. One day we're going to lay our bodies down. And so we are walking this tightrope all the time between two kingdoms, finding no peace really in either one because we are in this dilemma. Actually, it's not a dilemma. It's a misconception. It's a misunderstanding of Scripture. And it is, I might say, if I can be bold, a deception. Jesus is our example. So we look through the word and we see his life. We see that Jesus' life was never divided. He lived in the presence of God. He lived there from babyhood all the way until the death on the cross. God accepted his total life. And God himself made no distinction between this act and this act. God made no distinction between him going to the mountain to pray all night and asking the lady at the well for a drink of water. For Jesus himself said, I do always the things that please my father. So everything that he did, every act of life, everything that Jesus did was pleasing. And to bring that where you say, well, that was Jesus. Well, Paul said exactly the same thing. He said, whether you eat or he said, whether you drink, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. Exactly the same thing. In that every act of your life, is a contribution to the glory of God. We, we can see Paul said it over in Acts uh, 17, I think it is. He's speaking here of man. He, he's speaking, he, he was up on Mars Hill and, and, and he saw this altar and this inscription, the unknown God. So he stands up. And under the anointing and the power of the Spirit, he starts to preach on the unknown God. And, and so he, go, he preaches to them, and this is his sermon to them. And he said in verse, I'm not going to read all of it, but in verse 26 he said, And he made man from one common origin and one source and one blood, all nations of men, to settle on the face of the earth, having definite, determined, allotted periods of times. And he had fixed boundaries of their habitation, their settlement, their lands and abodes. So that he made man so that he made him so that he should seek God in the hope that he might feel after him and find him. Although 
He is not far from any of us. For in Him, for in Him, you're in Him. If you're in Him, that means He's around you. For in Him, we live. In Him, we move. In Him, we have our being. There's no such thing as two separate lives, the spiritual life and the natural life. It's all one life and it all is God's. Now, I am not saying to you that everything, that every act is equal to or in importance, it is equal to every other act. Uh, we, see, we know that Paul, when he, he, he was occupation was sewing tents. Well, we know that that wasn't equal in importance to him right in the book of Romans. Yet, it was accepted by God because if it was, it was God's will. It was accepted by God and God received it as a worship unto him. Are you listening? Uh, let's turn to Psalms 139. Let's see something <laughs> David said here. Lord, you know where I'm going. I... Psalms 139. Just follow the road, you know. If you're on a road and you're just traveling a road, that's I'm on a road and I'm going somewhere. In Psalms 139, David here, all of a sudden, there's a dawning in his heart. Now watch what that dawning is. How many of you have ever had a dawning in your heart? Maybe it took you by surprise. This one might have taken him by surprise. I don't know. He says in verse 1, Oh, Lord, you have searched me and have known me. That was God's seeing presence. His seeing presence was there. And all of a sudden, David is aware of that seeing presence. And then he goes on down here to verse, let's read it, verse 5. He says, You have beset me and shut me in behind and before, and you have laid your hand upon me. Your infinite knowledge is too wonderful for me, and it is high above me. I cannot reach it. Where could I go from your spirit? Where could I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the night shall be the only light about me, even the darkness hides nothing from you. But the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you did form me, my inward parts, and you did knit me together in my mother's womb. What is he saying? Right here, David, he has a great dawning in his heart. And that dawning was so simple. It was, God is here. God is here. He is. God is here. There is absolutely no place. There can be no place where he is not. Tonight, if I stood out 10 million miles way out into space, I would say, God, he is here. And you would be here. And you would be saying, God, he is here. There is no point nearer to God than any other point. Well, if God is everywhere, 
if we cannot go anywhere where he's not, we just read that in Acts 17, said he's not far from any of us, why then has not the presence of Almighty God been the most universally celebrated fact of the world? Why is it not? We'll turn to Genesis 28, and you'll see why. We see Jacob here. It says in verse 10, And Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a place. And he stayed there overnight because the sun was set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down there to sleep. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, God is here. That's what that's saying. Look. The Lord stood over and beside him, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and I will give to you and to your descendants the land on which you are lying. And your offspring shall be as countless the dust through the sand of the ground, and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south, and by you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed and bless themselves. And behold, I am with you, and I will keep and watch over you with care. Take notice of wherever you may go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done all of which I have told you. And Jacob does what do we do a lot of times? He sits up and he goes, Whoa, the Lord is here. It says, But I did not know it. You see, that the, those five senses of Jacob, the world, we might say, of the senses, had assaulted him and, and, and intruded upon until it got all of his attention. That is the greatest curse that came in through Adam is that our senses can be so in, intruded and so insulted, assaulted that, that they become so insistent and demanding. They take all of our attention. And so the invisible is swallowed up by the visible. The visible becomes the enemy of the invisible. And the lens, we might say, of your heart is so clouded that the city of God shining all around you, <laughs> but you do not see it. Nor are you even aware that it's there. My, my. And so we see Jacob, he did not have one minute, he had not one minute here been outside the all-pervading presence of God, but he knew it not. This was his trouble, and this is our trouble. We do not acknowledge his presence. And oh my, what a difference it would make. We would be like Jacob. We are constantly pushing 
the world of what we call the invisible into the future. That world of the invisible is not now. Yet Jesus went all as he walked in the earth and he said, the kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is here. His kingdom is here. You see, the presence of God and the manifest presence of God are not the same. Did you know that? The presence of God and the manifest presence are not the same. There can be one without the other. The presence of God is always there. The manifest presence of God is when we are aware. Are you listening to me? And so, what is our part? Our part, then, is that we should lead a life surrendered to the work of the Spirit. For you know that is the work of the Spirit, to show us the Father, to show us the Son. And I'll tell you, you walking in the presence of God is the difference between what we call nominal Christian life and a life filled with fire. That's it right there. That is the difference. The manifestation, that manifestation of God's presence, that is the difference. See, all, all of our great seeking and all of our great, oh, yearning and longing after God, it's, it is successful. Because God is forever wanting to manifest himself. And I'm telling you this. The revelation of God huh, to man is not God coming from a distance. But the revelation of God to man is not God coming from a, dis from a distance to pay us a brief visit with a momentary boop. No, it is not a matter of miles or distance. It is a matter of experience. I don't know where I heard this years ago. I heard this. Or I don't know if I heard somebody preach it or say it or read it or what. But it stuck in there. And it, and it was talking about this father. And he said, as I get older, my son is getting closer and closer to me. My, my son is getting nearer and nearer. Yet the son had lived in the same house with the dad all of his days. And there was only, there was only two days, I think, they were away from each other. So what is that daddy talking about? Is he, t is he talking about distance there? Absolutely not. He was speaking of experience. He, he, he was talking about the barriers of thought and the barriers that, uh, of feeling that distance them. Those things were disappearing and they were becoming closer in relationship. They were coming closer in heart. So we, we pray for an, an increasing degrees of awareness, for a more perfect consciousness of God. I mean, he's here. You don't pray, God, Holy Ghost, guide me and lead me. He's already doing that. You pray, God, let me be sensitive to that guidance. Why is it? I, I've asked the Lord this for years. Years ago, I asked him this question. Why is it that some Christians find God in ways that other Christians do not? Why does God manifest himself, his presence, to some and yet others to just struggle along? Heard somebody the other side say, well, it's personality, you know, personality. It has to do with the person's personality. 
But that is not right. Because yesterday, I went through my Bible, and I picked at random a bunch of greats from the Bible. People who I felt in my heart that walked on a very high road of spiritual plane, yet in the natural. And I began to compare their lives. They were as different as night and day. Just think of Elijah. Elijah, think of the difference in Elijah and David. Think of the difference between Elijah and Moses. Just in our, in our day, think of the difference between, if you know these, Charles Finney and John Lake. I'll tell you, their differences were as wide as life. Isn't that true? They were different in personality, in temperament, uh, uh, education, habit. Yet all of them walked with God. Every one of them walked with God. They didn't stay in their prayer closet all day long, every day. Dissatisfied with every, all of the natural activities that they had to do. They walked with God. What, what was that? What was the, the quality there? There had to be something where they were alike. And you know what that was? It was spiritual receptivity. Spiritual re receptivity. I'll tell you, there was something in them that was open, just open to heaven. There was something in them that, that, that urged them that urged them Godward. There was something, there was a spiritual awareness. And you know what I saw about them? It wasn't just a spiritual awareness, but they went on to cultivate that. They, they went on to cultivate it and to develop it until it became the very biggest thing in all their lives. They, they, they were not like, uh, we might say, the average Joe. They, they, they felt, when they felt this inward, this longing, they did something about it. They required, they acquired the lifelong habit of spiritual response. And then they moved from spiritual response when they began to walk in the high places to spiritual reflex, you might say. Spiritual, re you know, receptivity is not just one thing. You, you can't just say being receptive is one thing. I, I know in my own life, just defining it for myself, it is, it's being bent toward. I'm bent toward something. It's a sympathetic kind of response. It's a yearning response. It has a lot to do with desire, but not everything. Because it's present by degrees, meaning that we may have little of it, receptivity, or we can have more. I know people that are a little bit receptive, but I know people that are just, man, they're just wide open. And it is increased, it's increased receptivity is increased by, by exercise and it's also destroyed 
by neglect. Isn't that right? And it's not a force that comes down in your life on you like a seizure. It's not like that. It's more like a gift. Not a gift like I'm receiving a present from you, but it's like a gift in another person. And you see that gift. <laughs> and you're wanting it to come out. You see that gift and you want it to come out. And so, first of all, you see it and you recognize it. And, and it's like, it's like um, planting a little garden. And there's these little seeds. And they're so tiny and so tender. And you keep, you keep protecting them. You keep watching over them. You keep turning over all around them, turning over, turning over. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, in Hosea, I think it is 6, He has revived us so that we can walk and live before Him. All the time, every day. Do you know that Jesus died? I, I believe the greatest work at Calvary I believe it with all my heart. When Jesus died on that cross and he hung his beautiful head and he cried, it is finished. That veil of the temple was ripped. And that gave us access to that presence. Not that we would come there every now and then and get a spiritual hit and leave and walk back to a natural life of degradation, deprivation, or whatever. We, he died so that we would have access to that presence and that we would walk in that presence, not brief, momentary little visits. But we would live in the fire, that we would live in the glory, that we would live and walk in his presence all of the time. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, an amazing scripture. <laughs> amazing. Jesus. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are those that are in heaven. And the Lord said, We are surrounded by them. I heard somebody say this eternity is only a step away. People think eternity is way off in the distance. Have you ever been somebody when they're going on to glory? You know what they do? Skip over. Oh, it's so much closer than we think. Because he says here, therefore then, we are so arounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance that clings to and entangles us. Let us throw off everything of that five sense realm that, that attaches itself to us and draws our attention. Let us, let our eyes begin to behold this invisible but yet also visible place. Then if we go on down here, it says looking away to Jesus who is the author and the finisher. And then if we go on down, it says in verse 22, for you have come. You have come. Not you're going to come. We have this common fault of putting this whole world of God 
over into the future. That, that it would be some uh, trick of the imagination, we might say. This is like, but this is actuality. You know, I, I, I'm not wild about that imagination stuff. Because to me, what imagine, I mean, this is just my own opinion. Imagination, what it does, it just, imagination projects these, how would I say this? Projects like unreal images out of the mind, and, and then it seeks out to attach some reality to them. Do you know that faith creates nothing? Your faith never creates anything. What does it do? It just simply reckons upon that that is already there. So we see that your spirit has these eyes. And, the, and your spirit has these ears. And sometimes they become dull and feeble from such long disuse. But as God touches you, when God touches you, those eyes and those ears come alive. And they are, we might say, capable of the sharpest sight. Isn't that true? So, am I then for saying that we walk in God's presence? So what what do we do? Do we just forget about long periods of prayer or meditation or, or study of the word or going to church? No. Those things, as you walk, only purify that gaze. They only make it more direct. They, those, those times, those spiritual times, lift our heart and they let it just rest upon him. Now, we're going to go back to the level. Every day of your life, God has a, a level, a spiritual level that he wants to bring you into. A level of spirituality, a level in God. He wants to bring you to a certain level of presence equal to your natural situation. Now, I could show you a scripture, but I'm not going to for time's sake. If you go over to Exodus 34, you can read that. You'll, you'll see that that is scriptural. That's what happened to Moses. He had a task before him. He had something he couldn't do. So what is the first thing he does? He starts crying out for the presence of God because he knew that that presence of God could propel him and make him and help him to walk that out. And so the word of God says that the Lord knew exactly how much presence to send. He didn't send all of it because he said, Moses... I'm just going to let you see my back parts. That was enough glory and enough power and enough presence equal to his circumstance to push him over. And so God sent it. And so he walked out that plan. Now every day, every day of your life, God already knows the future. And so he wants to take you to a level, a spiritual level, that you are prepared for everything that would come that day. And so you have to let God 
touch you with his presence. Now, this is where we miss it. In the awareness part, and this right here, is that we don't commune enough there in God's presence I don't come here and pray right here and get up off my knees and leave God and say, okay, God, bye. See you tomorrow. We're on our own now, oh God. Praise the Lord for today. And then all day I'm pushing and straining to get through. No. God right there on my knees before him he touches me and he gives me presence for that day to walk above anything that would come my way that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that is what Jesus died for So we're just going to do that right now. I'm just going to show you how I do it, what I do. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. So you always begin with the Word. You're not going to begin. In the beginning was the Word and the word was with God. And so if you're going to stay in the presence of God, you're going to have to get with God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And so this is what I do every day, every day, to prepare myself to walk out whatever comes that day, to prepare myself. We're talking about tonight walking with God. So, let's just do Psalms 84. I'll do that one. Now, you're not going to get much touch, and you're not going to get much level from reading Leviticus. Looking for Psalms, Lord, help me find Psalms. So this is what I do. I'm just going to do this. You can do it with me. I wish I was closer to you. In the beginning was the Word, so I start with the Word. Now remember, I am going to a spiritual level right now to prepare me for what comes. So I begin in the Word. And I read, and I usually read out loud because there's something about reading out loud. And I usually put on some kind of music And so there we have the music. And so I begin reading. And I say this. How lovely are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul yearns right there. God touched me there. His presence was there on that. 
Now, wherever his presence is, you stay there. Stay right there. And you say that over to him. Until it stops, that presence stops lifting you. Are you listening to me? My, my soul, my soul yearns. It's still lifting me. And still, I still say this. My soul yearns. My soul. You know, sometimes those words will make a prayer that will make something come up out of you, a prayer. So you go from there. My soul, my soul, my soul, my soul. The Lord is touching me, so I stay there. I stay right there. I let him keep touching me there. Every time God touches me, it lifts me. I'm being lifted now. I'm being lifted, lifted into a place in God to walk out something in the natural that day. My, I don't know if we'll get off my soul yearns, but if you leave, my soul yearns and it's still lifting you, and you're going on to something else. You've missed a place in God. You've missed part of that presence that God is giving. Are you listening to me? My soul, my soul yearns. Father, my soul yearns for you. I long after you, Jesus. Help me to be more sensitive, Father. Now, don't just watch me enter in right here. Don't just watch what I'm doing, but enter into this place. We're going to a place in God, and God will also touch you. He will touch you, and he will prepare you. He will prepare you. And when you walk out of here tonight, you would have been changed by his presence and that presence will help you to walk out that natural realm. My soul yearns. Yes. 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 Every word of this is touching me. And so it's lifting me. It's lifting me. My soul yearns. Yes. It even pines. And it's so, it's so homesick for the courts of the Lord. And my heart, my heart, my heart and my flesh, my heart and my flesh cry out. My heart, all of me, Jesus, cries out. As long as that is touching me, I stay there. I stay there. And that is touching me. And in that touch of Jesus, it lifts me. It lifts me. It lifts me. Now when it stops lifting me, I go back and I read a little more. My heart and my flesh cry out. There's the touch again. There's the presence of the Lord. So I stay right there. So then I go back and 
I start over because the Lord is moving here. He's moving. This is living. This is living scripture, living. This is living words. These words are living in me, lifting me to the presence of Almighty God. And then somehow, I don't know, before long, you know, you're, you've changed your position and somehow you've gotten here. And it's more like you're the sparrow he's found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young even your altars O Lord of hosts my king and my God blessed happy and fortunate are to be envied are those who dwell in your house there it is there's the touch dwelling in your house. So then you might begin talking to the Lord there about his house. Lord, I remember that you said one time to me in Spanish, you began to talk about your house, that your house was my house and that we lived in the same place. Blessed, happy, and fortunate are those who dwell in your house, in your presence. And they will be singing, singing, singing. I just want to sing to you, Lord. Those people will be singing. Those that dwell in your house will, they will be singing. They will be singing all their days in every way. Wherever they walk, they'll be singing. See, I stay right there with that. And you stay right there. And you stay there. And so you stay there. And then the tape might change songs and it might be playing Oh Lord you're beautiful Your face is all I seek and So you're 
we're worshiping you. And you're seeing beautiful Jesus. soon a whole hour is gone by and it seemed like five minutes and so you're living in the fire you're walking in the fire you're moving in the fire my way. I'm prepared. Totally prepared. I'm telling you, an earthquake could come. And you'd be totally prepared. be a doorkeeper and stand at the threshold in the house of my God for the Lord God he is a son the Lord he is a son the Lord God is a son and shield and he gives grace and no good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly. For the Lord God, he is a son. Lord, he's a son and a shield. He is
I never read Hebrews 12, so I think I'm going to read it now. It says, You have come, you have already come unto Mount Zion. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to countless multitudes of angels in festal gathering, and to the church, the assembly of the firstborn, who are registered as citizens in heaven. And you are come to the judge who is God of all the earth, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And you are come to Jesus, the mediator, the go-between agent of a new covenant. And you are come to the sprinkled blood, which is speaking of mercy, a better and a nobler and a more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out vengeance. So see to it that you do not reject him or refuse to listen or heed him who is speaking to you now. Let us therefore receiving a kingdom that is firm and stable and cannot be shaken offer to God pleasing service, acceptable worship with godly fear and awe for our God is a consuming fire. If you would like more information about this ministry or a complete catalog of teaching tapes and other available materials, please write Mac Hammond Ministries, Post Office Box 29469, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55429. That's Mac Hammond Ministries, PO Box 29469, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55429.